Good evening, I'm Rory, Professor Rory Fitzgerald and I'll be chairing this evening's seminar, our method seminar series, and that's hosted by City University of London, European Social Survey, and that's in social research. Uh, if you'd like to pose any questions to the speaker at the end, you can do that in the Q&A and we'll read them out for her. Um, you won't actually be able to speak uh, in, in the session, but you can pose your written questions in the Q&A. So we've got a slightly different uh, topic this evening. Um, we're going to be moving from surveys to, so to deliberative methods. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Kerry Davis, Director of NatSEN Centre for Deliberative Research. And Kerry designs and leads on a range of projects focused on public attitudes and policy making in the context of democratic innovation. Um, but similarly to some of our earlier seminars, she will also be talking about um, differences of mode of, of, of uh, research. So there's a sort of similarity with some of the earlier themes as well. So carry our hand over to you and um, look forward to some of the questions as well at the end of tonight's session. Thank you. Great, thanks Rory. Uh, good evening everybody. So I'm just gonna share my screen um, in classic online fashion. wait for it to catch up. Great. Uh, so as Rory mentioned, I mean, the focus of my um, talk this evening is really about a series of work uh, that we've been doing at NatSEN um, in and around deliberative research. I'll say a little bit more about uh, what that is. Um, some of you may well indeed know, but I, I always think it's helpful to just kind of define some starting points before kind of launching into some more of the kind of methodological stuff uh, that I have to share. Uh, but principally, it's um, all about, uh, yeah, mode shift. So um, classically in and around deliberative research and processes of public participation that use deliberative methods. Um, we're very familiar with doing those face to face. Uh, but over the last year, as with so many of us working in and around social research, we've had to find uh, adaptations in order to continue to do our work um, in the context of social distancing. Um, but it's also worth saying, I think that, um, which is also part of what I'm going to cover tonight, as you can see here, is that there is a, already an existing field around kind of deliberation in the internet. Um, although it's considered very much under construction, it's really emerged um, in terms of the literature and scholarship in the last 10 years or so. So we do have a context and some starting points for what it might have meant to change the way in which we deliver our research. Um, so my goal really with uh, the time today is to offer a few starting points about the types of work that I do, um, which is principally qualitative, um, although there are some uh, kind of mixed uh, method aspects to some of the methods that we use. Um, share some practical examples of what we've done in terms of taking deliberations online and then spend some time reflecting on what I think some of the benefits and limitations of that are, both from a theoretical perspective, but also in practice. The other relevant thing that I want to then cover is uh, what we've been learning in the last 12 months. And when I say we, there's a kind of royal we of people, uh, practitioners, as well as scholars who are trying to think through um, and come up with practical adaptations um, and uh, forms of implementation that, that allow them to continue to do their work. And some of those, um, some of them have written that up into to kind of blogs and other outputs which have given us a bit of an insight into some of what works um, or what some of the remaining questions are when we're trying to do this uh, shift of mode. Um, and then finally I want to end with, um, I called it an outline of an agenda for methodological development which sounds incredibly grand, <laughs> uh, if only. I'd love to have a, a large agenda which I could crack on with but I just wanted to share some thoughts really about what I think all of this means in terms of what next and what might be fruitful principally from a methodological perspective, um, although obviously the overlaps with practice as you'll see are uh, kind of frequent and interchangeable. So this is what it's all about. Um, so I want to start off uh, with defining deliberation. So um, essentially it's just to cover, you will find a, a kind of broad range of debate in, uh, in the literature uh, around what it really means, uh, but essentially it's a, it's a normative principle that citizens should be able to participate in reflective and informed discussions. And they're two of the kind of key attributes about the questions and issues that affect them before reaching decisions on the way forward. So it's most commonly practiced in the context of deliberative democracy, um, uh, where citizens themselves have a say um, in shaping or informing or helping make decisions on kind of policy related outcomes. Uh, one of the other aspects of what defines deliberation is that the processes themselves, however they're constructed and delivered, should be capable, therefore, of improving the quality and the legitimacy of any related decisions, which is why they hold um, a useful place um, in, in the democratic context. But also it's kind of largely understood that 
uh, deliberation itself should be capable of changes, uh, making changes in participant opinion. Um, so the fact that, that, that discussions are reflective or infor and informed are themselves kind of hallmarks of uh, generating an informed public response. Um, and in addition to that, people who participate in these types of processes, um, it's thought to positively impact on civic competencies, so propensity to vote um, or some other kind of forms of community or civic action. So these are the, the, the general, and I, I am describing it in general terms, if there are any of you um, in this seminar who do this stuff for your job, I'm sure you've got kind of questions and definitions of your own, but these are the three main components. The other thing I wanted to do in defining deliberation is really just point to the fact then that um, often uh, in forms of uh, deliberation like citizens assemblies, which are very much kind of in some of the uh, kind of common discourse at the moment, uh, citizens juries, public dialogues, there are these three main phases which characterise what people do when they're in deliberative processes. So this is really just to kind of categorise some of the main things you would expect um, in any kind of deliberative event, uh, for want of a better word. And the other aspect that I think is important because it's relevant, certainly methodologically, um, so there's something about theory there, there's something about design, um, is what people are meant to be doing when they're in deliberative processes. So there is something about deliberation which is um, predicated on disagreement, so that there are multiple sides to an argument that, that those or a policy option, um, and those should be surfaced, um, and the pros and cons of different ways forward should be uh, available to people to have conversations about. Um, Deliberative work is therefore also characterised by the exchange of arguments or reasons or justifications rather than just a kind of top of mind considerations or sets of opinion. Um, and the other things that are important are um, about being able to encompass different means of expression that people might have. So not just solely relying on kind of factual evidential information, but you might also bring in lived experiences or, or stories or other forms of kind of communicating what's important to you. Um, and very often uh, deliberations also uh, involve the commissioning body. Uh, so say this was a citizen assembly, for example, um, very uh, recently, the citizen assembly on climate change was commissioned by six select committees in parliament. Um, and uh, those people were involved or that they plus others were involved in um, both designing and informing the work of the assembly, but then also taking some responsibility for the outcomes of that assembly um, and potential implementation of any decisions. So it's often important in these things, particularly in the uh, sphere of kind of policy making and public participation, that uh, there is this relationship between what people are asked to do, what they do, and then eventually what happens, with that, uh, which is contrasted, um, as we'll see with um, using deliberation more in social research practices where it can be used solely as a kind of mechanism and a design in order to kind of open up and explore uh, policy or research questions which may or may not be tied to a particular uh, kind of policy related outcome. So that's a little bit about defining deliberation and then in addition to that one of the things I think is important certainly again for the purposes of methodology is that there is a distinction in deliberative theory between uh, that which is pretty much discussed and understood in the context of political science, which is focused much more on um, public deliberation in the context of participation and, and democratic practices. Um, and those, as I say, which are used more in social research where we might take some of those principles and ideas, but use them um, in more of an, a, an applied way in terms of moving people through uh, various debates. Um, and what you'll see here as well is that the, in, in the kind of political science framework, although that's not the only field in which uh, deliberation sits, uh, there are deep methodological debates. So people spend lots of their time um, uh, disagreeing about or trying to identify what the ideal conditions for deliberation might be and therefore using those as ways in which to measure uh, whether or not small group deliberation achieves these normative conditions um, and the outcomes that the theory envisages for it. Whereas uh, principally in social research, although not exclusively, and when I say social research, I mean, as I say, uh, taking uh, the principles of deliberation and putting that into social research methods, social science methods, debates tend to focus more on the practical aspects of what enables or constrains people's deliberation. So whilst these are important, of course, um, across, across the piece, uh, that tends to be where people spend their time. So. Uh, so yes, deliberation in theory, deliberation in practice. Uh, the other kind of positional thing I want to uh, put down um, is that as with some of the, um, what's the best word to describe it, proliferation of perspectives and ideas 
uh, of deliberation in theory, obviously uh, the same is true in practice. And there's a wide range of different kind of methods, a spectrum, if you like, um, of methods and formats of the ways in which deliberation occurs. Uh, right through from kind of light touch, very short uh, format things that maybe take a couple of hours and where people are asked to consider quite a narrow set of information through too much to larger, longer term, sometimes even um, uh, kind of semi-permanent uh, settings that happen over kind of six months a year where people meet regularly over that time in order to explore uh, certain uh, certain questions and, and policy issues. So rather than read all of this out, it's really just to point to the fact that these are some of the things which people commonly consider when thinking about deliberation in practice. Um, and these are important because they are, all of these things have been derived through solely kind of our understandings of face-to-face. -face. Um, and so there are lots of questions obviously about how that moves over into a mode shift when we're thinking about doing deliberation online. Um, and the things that I've put at the bottom there are, are more theoretical in nature. They point to, where some of the theory meets the practice in terms of where some of the debates are currently, um, as I see it, uh, in terms of deliberation and deliberative democracy more broadly. So one of the areas of, of contestation that exists um, in the literature and has got implications for practice um, is around communicative norms, the principles that are meant to distinguish the discussions that people have when they're deliberating. Um, and I think in some of the kind of origins of deliberative theory, there was very much an emphasis on kind of reasoned argument. I've mentioned that a kind of rational exchange um, uh, of perspectives where reason is seen as neutral and dispassionate. Um, and what we know, well, what we know if you're on the other side of that, which I am, um, is that that in itself can exclude many people who may uh, put more value on the importance of values or emotions that can be expressed in a range of communicative styles. So if we restrict deliberations to only being about the, the meeting of some kind of reasoned rationalistic criteria, then we start to limit who can be involved and what we can learn from people. So that's one thing. Um, the other is around this idea to do with authenticity, which is uh, related to the idea that anybody who's involved in deliberations, and that includes people who commission processes and policymakers, for example, um, commit to do something with the outcomes uh, and that people come to deliberation uh, somehow free, magically free, <laughs> theoretically speaking, um, of kind of prior commitments and, and kind of um, um, aspects of power, which might otherwise, you know, uh, they might come with an agenda that they try to move through in deliberation, whereas um, in a normative sense, it's conceived in a, in a broader, more neutral way than that. Um, and the third thing is about contribution to the public sphere or the ways in which deliberation sits with respect to the public sphere. So a sociological concept, uh, which was originated by Jürgen Habermas, where the idea around the public sphere is that individuals can come together to freely discuss and identify uh, societal problems. Uh, and through discussion, they can influence political action. So there's a relationship to the ways in which people can convene and debate um, and, and uh, the relationship that that has to the state. And this is important because uh, if we move beyond ideas around representative democracy as the kind of sole way in which we operate, uh, that, that people should be able to kind of define and refine their interests and, and be able to uh, find kind of civic spaces in which for that to happen, liberation and its principles become one of the ways in which that's possible. So it's seen as an important concept with respect to deliberation. And again, there are people who dedicate their entire lives to the public sphere. So if you're one of them um, and I'm slightly hacking it, then I apologize and please do ask questions at the end. But I just wanted to place it as a way of uh, trying to draw together what I think are some of the, the fundamental starting points, which have implications for what I'm going to talk about next. So the fourth kind of and last starting point is around deliberation in the internet and thinking about where we are with that. So um, as I mentioned at the start, studies into deliberation in the internet have grown very much in quantity over the last decade or so. Um, and some of the reasons that this has kind of come to be interesting for people, apart from the fact that we have available technologies now and people um, operate differently with, with the rise and existence of the internet, um, is that when we think about some of the not necessarily the problems, but some of the conditions um, of doing deliberation face to face. Uh, the internet offers some interesting opportunities and some potential unique benefits. Some of those are about the prospect of being able to attend to issues of scale, 
um, how many people you can get in a room at, at any one time is often defined by kind of logistics and budget, for example, um, inclusion. So we know that there are people who won't necessarily be able to dedicate a weekend and come away from their home for various reasons, be that to do with their job, caring responsibilities, health conditions, um, who wouldn't otherwise normally participate in a face-to-face -face event. And so there's something about access uh, to the internet and technology which might facilitate their involvement. But also the cost of face-to-face -face exercises, which tends to be quite high um, by the time you've booked venues and sorted catering and put people up for the night and, and various other aspects, which are all reduced in the context of going online. I will say something else about cost later because I don't think it's a, um, a kind of neat equation between online equals cheaper necessarily. Um, so it's important to kind of uh, raise that. I think that's certainly something we've learned over the last year or so. Um, in a similar vein, being online also reduces the relevance of time, um, both in terms of like actual time zones. So we've been able to collaborate with people in the States, for example, on some of our recent work. Um, uh, and that might have been more difficult <laughs> uh, if we'd have uh, had to do it face to face. Um, access, as I say, which is a little bit similar to the inclusion point and geography. So one of the other things that we've been able to do is facilitate national deliberations um, in the UK context. Um, and, and not have to worry too much about the logistics of getting everybody in the same room at the same time. Uh, and then, uh, so picking up on the public sphere point, I think there's also a question that scholars around deliberation and the internet are interested in, is about whether this is actually an opportunity to widen the public sphere. One of the critiques of, um, of the public sphere is kind of conceived by Habermas in its original kind of theoretical form, is that uh, where is that I think in reality, so critics who talk about counter publics, people like Nancy Fraser and others, argue that the public sphere that Habermas thinks about is in fact constituted by a number of significant exclusions. Uh, so it might be a network of clubs and associations that might be philanthropic, professional or cultural, but are very rarely um, accessible to everyone. So if we are kind of providing or imagining that the public sphere is, a, is the space within which uh, this work and these discussions can happen, we have to pay attention to who's in them and who, who those spaces are available to. So it's not that the internet in and of itself is also not exclusive, which we will also come on to, but there's some interest in whether actually the internet and technology can realize some of the kind of true promise um, of some of the public sphere in terms of uh, a more accessible, less exclusive, uh, arena in which people can forward debate, have discussions about the things that matter to them and have that have a relationship to, uh, to institutions. So that was a lot. Uh, so studies into deliberation in the internet, they've grown. This is sort of why, although it's not the only reason why. Um, it's important, I think, when we're thinking about uh, what literature currently exists, uh, about the difference between using technology to convene deliberations, which is much more the focus of what I'm going to talk about now, um, and people who are interested in deliberative talk on the internet. So whether the kind of forums and spaces of the internet in that public sphere um, idea um, exist and can be found. So. For example, you'll find scholarship on, I was having a quick look earlier and some people have recently written a paper about kind of deliberation or the potential for deliberation in Twitter political networks. So that's another place in which these debates um, exist and, and the things that people are exploring, but it's, it's not what I'm gonna focus on today. I'm focusing on kind of whole deliberative processes that use technology um, in order to convene people. So one of the things about the existing state of the literature, which is also part of the uh, context for this seminar, is that much of the existing literature that we do have is about text-based interactions. Uh, so it's focused on discussion forums and chat rooms, um, and often these facilities are asynchronous, as in uh, not everybody's on them at the same time, um, and at times anonymous, which um, you know obviously relates to lots of other kind of things that we know or imagine. Um, about the internet and the ways in which people contribute to debate uh, therein. So as a result of that, we don't necessarily know an awful lot um, about using technology to convene deliberations in a kind of start to finish type way, what the experience of that is and what some of the potential of that is, as well as the problems. Um, but also the studies that do exist show that there are often several problems regarding deliberative quality. So going back to the beginning about uh, some of the things that might define deliberation and this idea of whether we're reaching it or creating the conditions for it in the work that we do. Um, what we do know from the existing literature is that text-based interactions alone have got implications there, not least because, um, as Willem puts it, uh, there can be a lack of civility to faceless others. 
So I'm sure we can all recognize that from our scrolling of Twitter um, at some point if, if we use that platform. And also it's his contention that reasoned views are less likely. So it makes it harder to meet some of those kind of deliberative ideas. So there's a need then, I think, to adapt design and technical architecture to ensure that online discourse can meet deliberative ideals. And, and this is where kind of we are at the moment and where I'm at with some of my thinking. Um, but also there are very few empirical studies that examine online synchronous exercises. So essentially something like uh, this is uh, the Climate Change Assembly or some of the work that we've been doing. So it leaves a gap for us um, in experimental and methodological work. What we do have, and I will pick up on in a little bit, is an increase in practitioner-led thinking. So uh, people who are currently trying to make these things work and trying to navigate their way through mode shift. So we do have now a series of experiences and anecdotes of practice about, works pra what, about what works practically well online, where people have kind of rushed, uh, rushed to make their work work. But I, I still don't think that we've um, su sufficiently attended to that kind of methodological gap. OK. So this is some of the work that we've been doing at Natsen, and I'll try and make reference to it um, as I go through with some of the kind of benefits and limitations piece. Um, and what defines some of this work is that the stuff on the left around the future of Britain, which is an ESRC funded project using deliberative polling, um, it was planned to be online always. So um, we originally set ourselves up with a design that would run a deliberative poll online and a deliberative poll face-to-face -to, -face to see if we could do some comparative work, um, both about the kind of attitudes that, uh, that were produced as a result, but also um, you know, what the experience was like and whether we could learn anything. Uh, and this was back in 2019 that we did the first poll. So as you can imagine, we've had to adapt our plans <laughs> uh, for that and we haven't been able to complete that comparative work. Uh, so in 2019 and 2020, we've now run two online um, weekend deliberative polls. So people have been with us all day on a Saturday and half day on a Sunday uh, to look at select policy areas that um, are now kind of uh, back more in the remit um, of the UK government now that we've left uh, the European Union. Um, and these have been deliberations at scale. So we've involved over 380 people in these um, in these processes now. Um, and so there's some, something in there for us around the ability to be online and the relative ease, although <laughs> I use ease very loosely. If any of my project team were on the call, they would not say ease. Um, uh, to actually get people together in the same space effectively uh, and, and the work that we would have had to put in or were planning to put in until we had to revise our plans uh, to get everybody together um, in person uh, last year. Obviously, there are large distinctions in that kind of effort and logistical piece. Um, so one was planned to be online. Uh, that's the future of Britain. And then the comfortable levers that you see on the right, that was actually had to be adapted online, as with most of our other deliberative work um, in the last year or so. And this is a different format. So it was a deliberative workshop, as you can see, a lot shorter, um, overall involved less people, um, but was very much focused on regionality. So originally we wanted to be able to go to specific areas versus the future of Britain work, which we wanted a, a kind of national representative sample, which is what we worked with in that. So the other, so I'll say a little bit more about those in a bit, but the other thing I thought might be useful just to share very briefly as we go into kind of benefits and limitations and some of the practical aspects um, is an example of another piece of work that we were running last year for DEFRA, uh, which was about engaging citizens um, on their views and attitudes to do with the environment and kind of future visions for uh, the UK um, going into 2045. And as you can see, we had a plan, which is on the left, which is pre-social distancing. So this is where a lot of people have been. Um, and then some of the adaptations that we had to make as a result of social distancing. So obviously moving online. Um, but I think some of the things which are relevant here, which I'll talk more about, are um, having to kind of break up sessions. So rather than kind of literally picking up all our plans and the agenda for a one day event, uh, we ended up deciding to break up the event into uh, kind of two constituent parts. Um, and the other thing which I think is uh, relevant to pick up from this is, is for the second part of that, um, having to look at the feasibility of different recruitment options, which became really relevant in terms of who you find to come and deliberate with you. Uh, so it's not just a case of thinking about the design of the deliberation itself and some of the things which are going to facilitate people's participation, but going right back to the start of your research idea. Um, when you realise that, that you rely on face-to-face -face contact for so much of what you do. 
Um, so previously in this particular project, we would have used a recruitment agency who often do kind of street recruitment um, and other forms of finding people just passing by. <laughs> um, and all of those options disappeared um, as a result of social distancing and so needing to um, consider the way in which we even find people, never mind what we do with them when they're with us um, in the deliberation. So I mentioned that um, there's been a series of recent developments, certainly in the UK, and I know that there have been uh, further afield, although that's not, not the focus of, of uh, what I'm going to talk about here. And in much the same vein as some of the project adaptations we made, the pandemic has obviously accelerated the range of people getting to grips with complete deliberative processes online and using technology in this way. Um, and this actually, I don't know whether, I, I doubt that it's wholly coincidental, but public participation is also having something of a renaissance of policymakers. We're seeing much more uh, kind of calls for citizens' assemblies, both nationally and also in local places, citizens' juries, other forms of kind of institutional engagement with publics. And so it has come at a time where we're all trying to work out um, how on earth we can achieve it. Um, but from those people who've been working in it, and there have been various workshops in the sector, uh, and people have kind of got their heads together to try and work out both what this mode shift looks like, but what we need to think about. So these are some of the things that have been coming out. So as I say, much of this sort of evidence is practice focused, it's largely anecdotal, but nonetheless, it speaks to, um, uh, it speaks to the very practical. And I'll come on to sort of implications for methodology in a moment. Uh, the first thing, which seems sort of obvious, uh, but is to do with platforms and software. So if you can't get people together in a village hall, where are you convening them? And what spaces are available to us online to do that? And what software is available to help us kind of navigate and see if we can map designs around people being all in one place, people being in small groups, people having kind of plenary sessions where they can answer and ask and answer questions of experts. So there's a series of different uh, considerations that have gone on there. Zoom has been our um, platform of choice in, in those projects that I've mentioned uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, one is about kind of security and privacy. One is about being able to kind of manage uh, what it is the participants can do uh, and what you can do as people who are kind of hosts or co-hosts, um, excuse me. And, but there are also another range of kind of more interactive forms of software. So Jamboard, Miro, a number of different ones that have come up which, um, facilitate the more kind of creative aspects of what people might otherwise do in a room together. So the loss of post-it notes has been, you know, severe for those of us who are in the kind of participation world. How do you recreate that online? I think the other thing that people have picked up on is, is the ask of participants. And we've had to think quite hard about that in our work. So how can you be sure that participants understand what it is you're asking them to come and do? Because the lack of familiarity we might feel with online spaces or certainly did you know, uh, six to eight months ago is also experienced by uh, by others. And so for people to really understand what it might mean, uh, the extent to which they've got a degree of not just digital literacy, but also confidence to kind of turn up, put their video on and engage with people they've never met before um, uh, matters. And obviously related to kind of the platforms and software point, uh, we've also learned that it's really necessary to put in place pre-event technical support uh, so that people know what they're coming to, they know how to use the platform, they know how to do basic functions, they can, you know, navigate themselves um, in the space, uh, but also that they can also um, kind of keep the rules of the space, like how many of us haven't muted when we were meant to, you know, so it's things which are familiar to all of us, um, but is uh, needs kind of specific addressing. The other thing that people have come to talk about is, is the necessity of mixing on and offline activities. Um, which isn't something which is particularly considered the other way around. So in a face-to-face -face context, uh, people don't commonly think, oh yes, what can we get people to do online in between events? It's not that it doesn't happen, it's just uh, there seems to be much more of an emphasis now on the ability to sort of blend, possibly, uh, synchronous and asynchronous work. I think there are two main thoughts behind that. One is about giving people multiple opportunities to engage with materials and share their thoughts and reflections. Being online is often quite an artificial experience um, and it can, it can feel relatively disconnected. Um, but I think the other is that it, it also means that you're not relying solely on talk. It's, it's more difficult, though not impossible, uh, to insert creative activities into what are essentially kind of virtual meetings. And so it gives people another way to contribute. It's not just that they get more time to kind of think and reflect, but also um, that that might uh, change the ways in which they interact with the information and what they do in the sessions themselves. 
The other thing which I mentioned um, in that in that very brief example of swapping our, our DEFRA project around is breaking content into shorter sessions. So there's some received wisdom knocking around at the moment that um, people can't concentrate or, or find it harder to concentrate online for longer periods of time. And therefore, it's necessary to try and adapt your deliberative design so that people get um, little and often. Um, having said that, it would be our experience with the Future of Britain work. So the ESRC project we've got. As I say, we had people uh, together all day on a Saturday, half day on a Sunday, and it didn't seem to particularly impact both people's willingness and ability to engage, uh, but also the, the nature of the discussions was generally quite lively um, and engaged. So I think that, again, there are always going to be multiple kind of perspectives, but we've had some success with longer sessions. Um, I think it very much comes back to kind of purpose. So as I say, you get lots of different forms of deliberate activity, which are there for different reasons to achieve different outcomes. And so I think that um, that flexing or the ability to be able to flex what it is that you want people to do um, obviously lends itself to that. Um, finally, two last things in terms of recent developments and learning. One is about uh, moderating civil discourse. So facilitators of deliberative work are generally like highly skilled people um, who are doing highly nuanced work. Um, and one of the things which we often rely on, so I'm putting myself in the highly skilled bracket, uh, one of the things we often rely on is body language um, and kind of nonverbal cues. These are things that would be familiar, not just to people who facilitate, but if you teach or you know anything like that, you're responsible for a group of people, you'll be familiar. So I think one of the things that people found quite difficult at the beginning was how you could do that online. And not just that, but also how do you know that people are looking at their screen and not also checking their emails, for example, or say in our Future of Britain work, one of the topics was around immigration and we were asking people to look at pre-prepared information and evidence. Um, but who, who's to say they weren't kind of Googling, you know, the Daily Mail or something to, to put in alternative statistics or draw in other points of view, which is generally frowned upon um, in deliberative work where people are invited really just to focus on the evidence that just presented to them rather than drawing in from outside. So there became a, a kind of need to also think about how we adapt um, in that way. And finally, I think one of the lessons that we certainly learned in our own work is about managing attrition. So typically in a face-to-face -face event, you might, um, you might need to recruit or ensure that you've got maybe 20% more participants than you actually want to turn up on the day. You normally lose uh, that many people in between. But our experience with our ESRC project is that it's more like almost half. Um, and I have some thoughts on that in a minute, but um, obviously uh, that has a big bearing uh, in terms of uh, designing projects. I mean, and one of the obvious reasons is, for example, it's a very nice evening. So you may well have indeed chosen not, well, it is here in Brighton. You may well have indeed chosen not to turn up to the seminar and go for a walk instead, which would be uh, a little bit. So I think that, um, yeah, these types of factors perhaps uh, weigh uh, more heavily. Uh, in the online space than they do it in, a, in the face-to-face -face world where the commitment might look different if you had to actually physically travel and sit in a room at city. So what are some of the benefits then out of all of that? So if this is what we're aiming for with deliberation, uh, we also know about some of the ways in which we now might approach it through this mode shift. Um, of taking deliberations online and we also know a little bit about uh, what people have been learning over the last 12 months or so. These seem to be some of the benefits that are rising out of that. So the theoretical idea would be that you can increase inclusion by going online. And we've certainly found that, again, anecdotally in our own work and others have too. There's also something about convenience, uh, both for participants and organizers. So it could be possible or more convenient for you to be able to just kind of like sit down in your kitchen rather than have to uh, travel to, to a place. Um, logistically, it's slightly more convenient for organisers. Convenience isn't totally quite the right word. But I think, as I say, that convenience can also have a kind of flip side. So it both might promote ease of access, but it may also limit kind of depth of commitment. And I think that um, might be slightly easier just not to turn up because you're not having to ring someone up and say no or not turn up in a space that you've made, yeah, you've bought bus tickets for. Um, so I think that there are both pros and cons to that, even though at a top level, it definitely is a benefit of using uh, technologies to, to bring forth deliberation. Um, I've mentioned scale, and I do think that that is something which, um, even with the kind of best efforts or, or large budgets in the face-to-face -face world, is something which um, is, a, is a kind of out-and-out -out benefit of online deliberative work. 
And I mentioned before the kind of the there's multiple aspects of potential cost savings, but one of the other kind of realities is also lower carbon footprint. Um, and I think tied up with um, that idea that you can stay where you are rather than having to travel somewhere is what we also know. So, for example, Devon County Council have just commissioned or are just about to start, I think, um, a citizens assembly on uh, climate change. Um, and they have noted in their own kind of work and preparations that in Devon, quite a lot of people are rurally dispersed. So it's not even a case of making it slightly easier for someone to turn up, but actually it may mean that people who wouldn't otherwise be able to get there because the bus isn't running um, or other forms of logistical restriction um, also help uh, with that kind of convenience piece and does lower carbon footprint as a, as a helpful consequence. But I think one of the other benefits, which um, even though <laughs> I have just said that it is more difficult to be creative online. I think it only is if you're, you know, the, the implication therefore is, is needing to put more time into exploring that. I think that the benefits of online are that it does encourage experimentation uh, with innovative and creative methods. Um, and there, are, there is some literature out there which starts to suggest what some of those might be. So um, it could be that if we're thinking about that very large scale, um, a kind of public sphere that I mentioned that actually might be able to crowdsource ideas maybe that is worth going through Twitter um, and finding them that way you know so where do ideas even come from for deliberation and if you think about the context of um, the public sphere being a place that should be able to kind of shape um, and bring forth um, discussions of importance then then that's one innovation I think that could, we could potentially do more with. Um, Despite needing to spend time thinking about new technologies and platforms, I think that um, Ipsos Mori, for example, did a workshop last year, uh, which I'll just show you a diagram from, where they were working with multiple people. So people who create, you know, technically create platforms, gamers, you know, kind of other disciplines and inviting them into the space to have a think about um, how, how those types of platforms might work for immersion in a subject um, or where people might be able to kind of gamify um, things which we might otherwise traditionally do face to face around exploring trade offs, for example. So maybe you don't just have to read a vignette, which you might do in the face to face world, but actually perhaps you can kind of play a game or, or um, I don't know, some other form of kind of immersive reality in order to have to walk through or select something or, you know, see the change in your I don't know. Uh, yeah, energy bills as a result of getting a heat pump in real time or, you know, so there are a number of different ways in which to kind of visualize and make real, um, which are unavailable um, or currently in face to face settings on the whole. Um, but also just as large scale, large scale data capture can work for things like crowdsourcing of ideas, it could also be a window into other forms of, uh, of public attitude capture. Um, and I think that the other aspect of this as well, which is often quite common with some forms of deliberation is that even if you're not one of the people selected to participate in the event itself, um, it's very common in terms of, again, a, a kind of ideal scenario that people, everyone should have the opportunity to access the evidence or have some kind of say, even if they're not, not in the room. So um, the ways in which kind of online forums or settings can promote that or perhaps make that slightly easier, um, both for the people running it, but also for the people who want to participate. And I think that um, that is another area to focus in terms of benefits. Um, so I mentioned the Ipsos Mori report and I really thought I'd just include this because um, I didn't put the page number, apologies, I will find it. Um, because I think it just helps to visualise certainly the outcomes of the workshop that they did um, in terms of thinking where if we just invert it slightly and think what, what are some of the benefits we have here rather than, uh, rather than the slightly more deficit approach of how do we adapt face to face for online. It's like, actually, if we did online, what would it give us? Uh, what are some of the benefits here? So this is just a, um, I thought this was a sort of nice example of where some of these different things that the online would give you and how they could map onto um, deliberative processes and the process of engaging with policy problems um, and providing solutions. Okay. So just keeping on time. So that's benefits. Uh, limitations, again, I think that they, they stem very much, not unsurprisingly, from, uh, from the kind of theoretical backdrop. They are counter to all of the benefits. They are just the flip side. So um, it may well be potentially more inclusive or we may be able to attract potentially more diverse audiences to online work, but actually we have to contend with digital exclusion and literacy. One of the things that we lose and, and currently don't have a way necessarily to replicate uh, with online that you do face to face is this kind of sustained person to person dialogue. So the coffee break when you go to get your biscuits, when you walk to lunch, you know, these types of things are obviously all absent 
So how you recreate them um, when we're distanced is a question. Um, I mentioned investment in attendance and, and the potential ease with which people might just choose not to turn up um, as opposed to uh, having to book your tickets and come. Plus the fact that I think now that we're sort of 12 months into everything happening online, even though there's a lot of promise related to online, we might also be encountering like Zoom fatigue. <laughs> so, um, and then finally, I think that there is a sort of running assumption that being online is super convenient, but it somewhat assumes that you've got somewhere private in your home that you can sit somewhere where you can be free from distractions, somewhere where you share the internet, where like, you know, you and all your kids are also not trying to use it at the same time. Or, you know, so I think that there are some sort of real uh, kind of practical uh, constraints and assumptions um, that we risk making about people's participation that we have to put in. Um, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word. Substitute is not the right word. Mitigations, there we are, four. Okay. I'm gonna whiz over that because I kind of said it. Um, so implications for methodology then. So I think um, there are two, I think there are kind of the dual problem of what works um, is what we're grappling with at the moment. And I think that means both practically, so how do we make this stuff happen? How do we ensure people can participate? But also how are we understanding kind of fidelity to the method through using um, online methods and where is that kind of evidence gap? Um, and so you can see here that there are kind of three main areas, I think, in which um, it's useful for us to understand and be able to demonstrate more kind of indi indicators of efficacy um, of deliberative processes online. Um, and that they are substantial and that they can be robust in terms of their findings. Um, so I think um, Rebecca Sandover and colleagues Exeter, I mentioned the uh, Devon Climate Change Assembly. Um, just before that happened, some uh, people at the University of Exeter did a rapid review about online deliberations, what do we know, um, and they suggest from that that there's nothing inherent about the online medium that makes high quality deliberation unattainable, and what's really critical are, are the conditions of the discussion. But I think part of the problem that we find ourselves in methodologically is that, as I mentioned earlier, there's still quite a lot of disagreement amongst scholars about which indicators best gauge uh, deliberative quality. So the fact that we don't have agreement on that um, in all of our practice to date, then maybe makes it slightly more complicated about what we might look at and how we might measure um, some of these things online in order to be able to demonstrate uh, robustness and efficacy. So I think that there are a series of things there which really inform the next thing about where we should go next. Um, I have three whole minutes, I think, if I'm going to try and stay at 45. So let me a whiz through speed up. Um, so obviously, where, where should we go next? Well, I think some of this points to the fact that we really need to focus on making the case and, and some investment there um, from people who want to think about it and people who want to do it um, is fruitful. Um, I think that it is about demonstrating effective conditions for online deliberations. And, you know, obviously, in, in, another, in another circumstance, you would suggest comparative work is really the best way to do that. Um, but I think we need to be a bit more creative about imagining how we can do that in lieu of comparative work until we're much more uh, kind of back to um, the possibility of face-to-face. -face. I think it's also important in making the case that we maintain this distinction between deliberations that improve processes of public participation and those that are about using deliberative principles in research processes to explore public attitudes because they push for different outcomes. So even though the, the deliberation itself and, and, and what's happening in it is um, uh, there's some kind of crossover there. I think if you're ultimately going for different outcomes, it makes a difference to the case that you need to make in terms of what the deliberation's doing and why. Um, and the other thing I think in terms of making the case that's important as a guiding principle, I suppose, more than anything, is about positioning the development of the field, sorry, positioning this development as a field with its own potential and strengths, rather than solely as a kind of poor relation or a substitute for face-to-face -face arrangements, which, we're, which is, I think, where a lot of us started uh, kind of 12 months ago or so. So I think there's some work to do around making the case. I think also um, where we should go next methodologically is thinking about examples and the application of online deliberations for contemporary problems and questions. So, you know, for example, you may have come across the Citizens Convention on UK Democracy. This is an attempt to try and engage government on its um, proposed commission um, on uh, democracy and rights and involving citizens in that process where scale is required. So how do you ensure that as many people in the UK as possible might have the opportunity to engage uh, in a deliberative as opposed to a consultative way? And so perhaps online gives us some solutions there. And we also know that we're in the middle of some major policy topics and questions, not least on COVID recovery, which quite a lot of people are already trying to insert deliberative processes uh, alongside. 
um, and there are uh, so I think that's another place that now is the time to kind of push a little bit about what we know and what we're doing online. Um, and then finally, finally, um, this was really just a, because it's a personal interest. And I think it's also interesting to think not just about where um, taking deliberations online might take us in terms of understanding them better, but also whether this is a good opportunity. Now we're looking at new modes and mode shifters on the cards uh, to kind of revisit some ongoing questions with respect to uh, deliberations. And one of those is around the politics of knowledge. Um, so whether online gives us unique benefits around reaching um, diverse voices, both in terms of people who participate, but also experts. So we know that very commonly um, it might be easier to yeah, engage a wider range of people online than it might be to kind of formally get someone to turn up at an event. And does that mean that we bring through uh, more diverse voices uh, and experiences as a result? And perhaps even if, if thinking about the kind of crowdsourcing or the, the sort of larger data question, does that help us make different choices on the inclusion and emission of content and knowledge and evidence in deliberative spaces? Um, so I think that there is some uh, more thinking to do there. And finally, I think mostly because we're unable at the moment to really have some good measures and demonstrations of efficacy above and beyond um, the anecdotal, do new modes kind of help or hinder existing debates? So I've been thinking about um, ideas around institutionalization, so the extent to which deliberative processes taken up and run alongside uh, representative processes of democracy and some of the kind of querying or perhaps the um, lack of confidence that some people have kind of commissioners and others um, in the online because they think perhaps it's not as robust or as valid, um, but it's where we are now. So are there ways in which we can articulate and describe uh, what we're learning um, about the online that can give people confidence about um, kind of continuing on um, or with using these methods both on and offline I should say in order to kind of make change. So I'll leave it there. Uh, the very last thing I'm going to show you briefly is um, the four questions is that uh, obviously I'm the director of the Centre for Deliberative Research at NatSen and we've got a launch event um, in about a month's time. Um, this is the topic we're, we're kind of focusing again on the online, but as you can see from a wider range of speakers and perspectives. So if this has been interesting and you'd like to hear a bit more, we'd be delighted um, if you might consider joining us then. So I'll leave that there. Thank you, Kerry. Fascinating um, lecture. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, question, I'm going to get in first with just one question from me. And obviously at the beginning of any event like this, there's this this process of making people feel comfortable and relaxed how is that much more difficult in an online forum and how how do you go about doing that differently or is it or is it a similar process it is it is more difficult because you don't there's no informality i think the first um you know no opportunity for informality the first work piece of work that we did with the ESRC project we had everybody turning up in the same zoom meeting at the same moment so there was just like this rush in of people um who all started trying to talk to each other and you realized well this isn't very effective so i think that um it's important to to acknowledge that there is no warm-up often for people um and that might make a difference to what you do first or what you do next um but i also think there might be the opportunity for a bit more creativity around that because again large-scale deliberative processes often have like a, a kind of friday night dinner before the deliberations start on the saturday so i wonder what we can learn from that um to try to yeah make it slightly more informal as a beginning rather than this very kind of um, potentially stiff entry point thank you okay so moving some questions from uh, the attendees uh, what do you look for and how do you uh, qualify the validity of literature regarding the practice and content of deliberative methods well i think that um i think it's horses for courses slightly because i do think that there is often there is often a, a kind of actual, I was gonna say, yeah, no, a more perceived divide between people who spend their time solely thinking about and kind of constructing from a theoretical basis in terms of deliberation and those who are involved and immersed in the kind of delivery on the ground, kind of what works side of things. And I'd like to think that there's a better relationship between those two things, but I often think that there's not. So in terms of um, what you look for in terms of constructing validity, I think it's unfortunately quite subjective. Um, one of the tests that I often put on things, especially when, you know, in the kind of qualitative world, 
I've used anecdotal quite a lot tonight and I had a, I had to think to myself about whether that was quite right or not because arguably quite a lot of qualitative work is you, know, you could argue it through to being anecdotal at some point right so I think that for me it's more about where you can look for the tie-ups between what people might have said theoretically because those things haven't come from from nowhere and do you see overlaps what does it look like to try to put that into practice and can there be a bit more of a conversation between the two so I think the validity piece for me is more you know, rather than then running as completely parallel streams, what are we learning from one or the other to inform the other um, as a way of, of trying to increase, I think, the validity, almost like a kind of triangulation like endeavor. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I'd say initially on that. Thank you, Kerry. Um, next question, how do you ensure that you can capture demographic information from participants who actually attend? It was easier face-to-face -face around the table. We can capture from people who book in advance. Or complete a survey after but more difficult at the actual virtual event any any tips yeah i mean i think that um i the only tip i've got is relatively functional which is creating space in your design for everyone to complete the information you need them to so you know we've ended up a couple of times kind of making sure that there's 10 minutes at the beginning where if somebody hasn't completed the pre-survey uh, which may indeed capture that demographic information that there's still time at the beginning a little bit like in a face-to-face -face, if someone turns up and they haven't completed the registration you give them the form uh, so trying to replicate a bit of time for that um, but and then I think the other thing which is a little bit uh, yeah again quite instructive but you don't release the incentive until you have the information you need um, so quite often people will then you know you end up getting a fuller picture thank you the next question was about is about concentration and the question asks about people multitasking essentially during deliberative polling and um, says you, you know you wouldn't get get their undervisors attention perhaps as much as you would in a face-to-face -face environment how would you how do you tackle that i mean i think that um one of the things i didn't talk necessarily about there it is uh both in the face-to-face -face and the kind of online world you'd set ground rules with people and i think that that uh kind of um, agreement making at the beginning of any work is important and I think you perhaps have to go a little bit further to specify what that might mean in terms of people's concentration so there's a there's a kind of um, a social pressure aspect to it in terms of can we all agree this is what we'll do or if you need to take a break that's fine but um, but then I think that it again there's this aspect of moderation which you do less um, in sort of real life where you perhaps have to loop people in more regularly so you know you have to kind of call people out a little bit or check on something check understanding to ensure that people are more engaged with you um, I think the reality is that without some kind of clever software you can't guarantee that people are only looking at you and only participating in this conversation so that there is some reality with that um, but I think it's that kind of mixture of sort of hard and soft approaches to uh, trying to get a sort of first up agreement and understanding of what you're doing when you're in a in a space with others and the commitment that you make to it, but also what small kind of tricks or tips you can use, you know, sending them a direct message in the chat, something, something, if it, you know, if it looks a bit like they're gazing at their phone the whole time, for example. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question from Muriel Cameron um, saying there's a major proposal currently to push for a Scottish Citizens Assembly, which sounds very exciting. Yeah. Uh, do you think this is viable online? I'm going to say yes, obviously, because <laughs> otherwise, what am I doing? Um, I, d I think we know enough about the starting points to think about making it viable online. And the other thing that I've understood about that um, kind of major policy commitment in terms of the citizens assembly is that it'll be ongoing. So it's not just going to be a one off, right? It'll be reconvened at different times with different people. Um, and I'd like to think that actually the online might provide um, again, some more kind of convenience um, and kind of logistical ability to involve more people. Um, so I think we've got enough learning to date to certainly start to start there and I'd like to think that um, we know enough in terms of the practitioners who are supporting those types of efforts to make that uh, a reality. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, what are the differences between deliberation and consultation? Mm. So I think the principle I would say that the principal difference is that with deliberation, what you're seeking to do is get to a position of informed opinion that often has some kind of decision making connected to it as a participant, whereas forms of consultation tend to be at the, the different end of participation where you may indeed be giving people like some information, 
but you're not really committing to do anything with what they tell you. <laughs> so I think it's a it's a kind of degrees of participation thing. And I often think of um, so Sherry Arnstein many years ago now uh, came up with this ladder of participation where she connects kind of forms of um, engagement with people with um, what those things do, what the potential outcomes are for people. So it's all to do with kind of empowerment and um, decision making. So consultations right at the bottom. Excellent. Uh, interesting question here. Do you find that you collect more material now with this augmented reality and additional tools available compared to the old post-it notes? Yeah. Sounds like you were missing the post-it notes earlier. <laughs> Could you tell? <laughs> I have, just leave some around me, you know, just for familiarity reasons. Um, oh God, I do actually have some by me. Um, I think that the potential is that you can. I think my... I so far in the work that we've been doing, we've not gone too far into the kind of bells and whistles of what platforms uh, can do for you beyond providing a space where you can all see each other. Um, so I think that it is highly possible that you do collect more data. The reflection I have on that is the um, is what you think you're going to do within. So I think there's a risk potentially, or I don't know, I'm thinking out loud to myself, but you know, a risk potentially that you kind of go through a more intense form of data gathering, but if you don't have a plan for really why you're doing it and what you're going to do with it um, and how it informs your analysis, then you might it might all just you might just end up with too much with no you know uh, without any good reason. So I think that's always worth bearing in mind. And uh, last question for this evening: um, Do you find online comments more honest than post-it notes or whiteboards? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think maybe slightly so. I'm just trying to think about the degree to which people put effort into what they're saying if it's into a room of others versus just, you know, kind of typing what they think without without over over wordsmithing it. Uh, so I think that it is possible. And um, I'm just trying to think. So the thing that's running in the back of my mind is if you set people up well, they should feel able to tell you whatever they want, um, whether that's you know, kind of mode irrelevant. But I think, yeah, people, you know that kind of message board type format that that we would have running in a session through the chat box and other things is yeah perhaps people uh, do tend to be a bit freer with just kind of putting it out there um yeah within the bounds of civility lovely thank you very much for answering all the questions and thanks for a wonderful lecture i think everyone really really enjoyed that um just to let everyone know we will make the recording with the slides available shortly afterwards and my colleague stefan swift will let you know when they're available and finally, just to say that our last seminar um, before the summer break will be on the 23rd of June, when Amelia Petcheva will talk about survey language as influence on response, the response formation process. But for tonight, thanks again to Kerry and thanks to everyone for attending and um, please have a lovely evening. Bye bye. Thank you.